Anthony Dworkin is the research director and a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He leads the organization's work in the areas of human rights, democracy, and justice. Among other subjects, Dworkin has conducted research and written on European and U.S. frameworks for counterterrorism, the European Union's human rights strategy, and the pursuit of justice in the international response to mass atrocities. Since 2011, he has also followed political developments in North Africa after the Arab er uh, uprisings, with a particular focus on Egypt and Tunisia. Before joining ECFR in 2008, Dworkin was executive director of the Crimes of War Project, an NGO that worked to raise public and media awareness of the laws governing armed conflict. He co-edited the book Crimes of War, What the Public Should Know, and wrote extensively for the project's website about war crimes and contemporary conflict, in addition to conducting training sessions on the laws of war and international justice in several countries. Dworkin has written and spoken widely on questions related to human rights, democracy, and justice. He is the contributing editor for the British magazine Prospect and has written for several other publications, including the Financial Times, The Guardian, the International Herald Tribune, The Washington Post, El País, The New Statesman, The Times Literary Supplement, Foreign Policy, and World Politics Review. He has been a member of the Terrorism Counterterrorism Advisory Committee and the London Advocacy Advisory Committee of Human Rights Watch. Dworkin has also worked as a producer and reporter for BBC Current Affairs. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that introduction. And for me, really, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm delighted that I could come in person. Um, and it's good to see so many of you here, you know, I can imagine that Europe seems a long way away from Utah. But what I want to try and do in my talk is to talk a little bit about why um, the United States should be concerned about relations with Europe and why um, the United States and Europe have a lot of shared interests, specifically on this question of international order, but also some differences. So to try and capture the, the commonalities and also the tensions between how Europeans and the United States look on international order um, at this particular moment. And this is something that I've been working on more recently in ECFR, um, the, you know, the frameworks for international order and the, the current um, rather messy <laughs> situation. The, your lecture series captures it very well with the, the idea of the new international disorder. Um, so one of the um, advantages about working on international politics is um, you know, that there's always something happening that's related to your work. And so I thought I'd start my talk by um, events of the last week. I don't know if you have picked this up, but we are in the middle of a big diplomatic row between the United States and France. Um, France, obviously, one of the most prominent and influential countries in the European Union. And um, within the last few days, the French foreign minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian, accused the United States of lying, which is not something that diplomats normally do. Um, he says that the United States is guilty of duplicity, a breach of trust, and treating France with contempt. Um, and it's not just France, the president of the Council of the European Union, said the United States President, President Biden, had shown a lack of loyalty to Europe's allies. What's this all about? You may know it's about um, this new um, alliance between the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom. And as part of that alliance, um, there's a major new submarine deal where the United States is going to sell nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. And this is part of President Biden's strategy to um, build up containment of China in its region. So he wants to provide you know, powerful submarines to Australia that's going to be part of strengthening them to withstand pressure from China. Um, but it just so happens that France had a pre-existing contract with Australia to supply slightly less powerful submarines, um, which is going to be canceled as part of this deal. Now, the French contract was worth actually $66 billion. Um, so that's uh, quite a big deal. 
there's this famous, um, probably you may have heard this, American senator who once said, you know, a billion here, a billion there, and soon you're talking about real money. <laughs> well, you know, $66 billion is real money. Um, and so a, a lot of this um, upset that we're hearing from France is to do with, you know, simply the fact that they're losing a lot of money. They had described this as the, the deal of the century, a rather Trumpian term. Um, and so, you know, they've missed out on that. But I think underneath this, um, one reason why this has um, blown up in the way that it has is that it comes at a moment of some sort of complications and tensions in the relations between the United States and France, and more widely in the relations between the United States and Europe. And this goes very much to these questions of international order that are the theme of this lecture series. Um, so I was going to say something very quickly about myself. Um, I had a, a detailed introduction, so you know my background and what I've worked on. Um, one thing that you may not know, but which I feel I should put out there, is that I'm actually an American. I don't sound it, but I. Um, I have an American passport, and that actually is the reason that I'm here, because if I was only a British citizen, then I wouldn't be able to travel to the United States under the current arrangements. Um, that also is a point of tension between the United States and Europe, and it's something that, um, as you may know, President Biden has now changed. Um, so let's start with the, you know, the, the reason that I might not have been able to be here, the kind of the dominant issue in international politics at the moment, um, because I think it shows quite a lot about the way that, um, that international order is working, and of course I'm talking about COVID. The main responsibility of governments is to protect the health and security of their populations, and COVID-19 has represented a threat to populations all around the world um, that uh, you know, you'd have to go back a, a long time to find something on this scale, um, and also of this universality. Now, you might think that a threat, you know, a disease which is spread so quickly, which does is no respecter of borders, which flies around the world, and which is affecting every country in the world, would be an occasion for the world to unite and come together. You know, surely that is what international order is for, is to fight against uh, a common threat. Um, and there was this famous moment during the Cold War when President Reagan was talking to um, Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and trying to say, look, we should work together. And he said, imagine that, I don't know if you know this story, imagine that there was an invasion from outer space. Then we would all come together and we would work, you know, we'd forget our differences and we'd work together to find a way to fight that. And in a way, you could say COVID-19 is something on that scale. It threatens everyone. It's a natural threat. It's not you know, weaponized by one country or another. And yet, it hasn't had that effect. If anything, it's had the effect of increasing international divisions and increasing international tensions. And you know, why is that? I think the reason is it came at a moment where there were already such, you know, such a complicated situation in the world and so many divisions that um, countries seized on this threat as a way to maneuver against each other rather than to come together. So that is the international disorder that we're talking about. Um, just let me, you know, very briefly, you probably have talked about this as part of your class, just um, go back to sort of summarize how I see the way that international order has developed in, in recent decades. The idea of international order as we understand it now came out of World War II. Um, there was an attempt after the devastation of World War II to create a new system based around the United Nations that would bring an end to war and create um, you know, a new form of order and a new relation between peoples. Um, so that was quite a an order based quite heavily on sovereignty. It was based on the idea of non-interference in other states and peaceful settlements of disputes through the UN Security Council. Um, but very quickly, it was overtaken by the Cold War. And during the Cold War, you had a new kind of order that evolved. It was a, you know, 
there was the overall order of the United Nations, which was rather paralyzed by the Cold War. And then within the West, you had a much more developed form of order that, um, that grew up. It was partly a security order based around NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to defend the West and the free world, as it was described, against the communist world. But it was also an economic order based around deep trading relations between Western countries. It was based around the financial system embodied in the International Monetary Fund. And it was based around a certain set of values, human rights and democracy. Now, not all members of the West were you know, fully fledged democracies. They didn't all completely respect human rights. And yet there was this sense that the West stood for something. Um, it stood for this notion of freedom against the, the communist states during the Cold War. When the Cold War ended, there was an attempt to expand this form of order to the world. Essentially, the idea was that they would take the kind of deeper order that existed in the West based around economic integration, based around free trade, based around some commitment to democracy and human rights, and that this would expand outwards. The hope was that after the Cold War, communism would lose its appeal and its credibility, and um, the countries of the world would broadly converge around democracy, around liberal values, and this kind of integration could tie countries together. Um, it was almost like um, taking children and uh, you know, badly behaved children and socializing them through contact with others, through bringing them together into the system of a school. The idea is that they would grow up and learn to be responsible citizens. And there was actually a famous um, American diplomat who had this idea that China would become a responsible stakeholder in world affairs um, through integration into the international system, through economic ties, through trading with the West, and so on. So that was the hope. And that was the hope that was shared by the United States and Europe at that time. Um, and there was this hope that, that we would move towards a you know, what sometimes is called the liberal economic order. An economic order across the world would embody these kinds of values. And going back to some of the things I used to work on, this would also be an order that paid much more attention to human rights, that punished mass atrocities, that, um, you know, set up a system of international justice through the International Criminal Court, um, that it would be based around integration, um, globalization and convergence on a certain set of democratic values. So what happened? Well, the countries that were being integrated into this system, um, they grew up, but they didn't grow up into the kind of countries that the West was hoping they would grow into. Instead, they grew into much more powerful, um, but illiberal countries. And so instead of seeing a convergence around illiberalism, we now have, and I know you discussed China last week, we now have an international system where um, you know, the, the trend is, if anything, away from democracy, where China is an extremely powerful country that's doubling down on an authoritarian system, where Russia is increasingly assertive, um, and other countries like, uh, for instance, Turkey in the European neighborhood or Saudi Arabia are also increasingly um, push, you know, throwing their weight around internationally, uh, but without this kind of convergence that it was hoped would happen towards democratic values. Um, but the, the project did succeed in one way. It didn't succeed in making countries liberal, but it did succeed in tying countries together. And so we have this world now, which is much more integrated economically than ever before. The ties between Western countries and China now surpass anything that happened between the United States and Russia during the Cold War. Um, we're tied together through globalization, which has really moved ahead. We're tied together through um, technology, which has transformed the way that um, you know, so much of our lives are conducted and which has really uh, had this profound effect in minimizing the effect of distance and minimizing the effect of national boundaries. If you think of, um, you know, in internet products or internet services, they are kind of touching the whole world at the same time. Um, and we're also facing these new threats, which are partly sp spread by globalization and technological change and 
global, you know, develop industrialization. So we have climate change, which is something that now threatens the whole world, which doesn't respect borders. And um, of course, we have pandemics, which are turbocharged by the degree of international connections and international travel that exists. So we have a world where we're tied together, um, we're integrated with each other, but we have profoundly different sets of political systems and different kinds of values. And we have a world of competition um, between these geopolitical powers. Uh, and so what's happening, I think, is that this form of competition, instead of seeing these linkages and these common threats um, as a way to bring the world together, which was the, you know, the great hope of the liberal international ideal, um, they're becoming themselves sources of competition, sites of competition. So if you think about um, technology, you know, who is going to be the leading country in terms of setting standards for artificial intelligence? Is China going to dominate artificial intelligence? Or is the West going to dominate AI? Um, you know, if China is installing its components in the 5G networks uh, of countries around the world, is that going to give them a kind of advantage, a degree of control, um, a degree of influence in these countries that we should see as a defeat for the West? Um, what about uh, econ economic ties that I talked about? Um, you know, we see instead of global trade being mutually beneficial, we see countries using their control over trade and their control over financial flows for political reasons. So when um, Australia called for an investigation into the origins of COVID-19, uh, China didn't like that. And so China blocked imports from Australia of beef and wine, you know, kind of having a major impact on the Australian economy. Um, it's not only China who does this. When um, the United States pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal under President Trump uh, and the European countries wanted to continue, the United States was able to impose financial sanctions, which affected the ability of European companies to do business with Iran completely outside the United States. Uh, but because these transactions took place in dollars, they were rooted through American banks and effectively the US could block that. So, you know, you can see these interlinkages, the way that they become the word, the technical term is weaponized. Weaponized interdependence is the new buzzword of international politics. And effectively, what it means is that these interconnections um, are being used for political advantage. And you could even see the same in terms of flows of people. For instance, in Europe, which is particularly sensitive to migration questions, some of the countries around Europe use the flows of migration and threat to release migrants into Europe as a kind of form of political blackmail. This is something that Turkey has done, it's something that um, Morocco has done, and it's something that Belarus on the eastern border is threatening to do now with Poland. So how does Europe deal with this world of um, you know, of interdependence, but competition, and how does the United States deal with it, and how do these two relate to each other? This, I think, is one of the crucial questions in international politics today, and I think it's one of the crucial questions in transatlantic relations. Uh, and to sketch that, you know, how this plays out, I just want to fill in a couple of things about the EU and how Europe sees the world. Um, First, although I said that Europe and the United States were really working together as part of the West during this, you know, both during the Cold War and the post-Cold War period of sort of optimism that a liberal order might come about, there are always some differences between the way that the Europe was looking at this and the way that the United States was looking at this. And the first difference, I think, is that the, there was a kind of division of labor. The United States was always providing the security. Um, and what the Europeans like to think of themselves as doing was providing the kind of institutions and the values that would sort of make it a liberal order. Um, and why was this the case? Well, Europeans love institutions. They love processes. They love rules. And they love international law. And they like these things more than the United States has historically liked them. Um, actually, 
they don't really have a choice but to like them because the European project of integration through the European Union is a kind of embodiment of that approach. The idea was, you know, Europe had been the site of conflict and war for centuries, including, you know, two terrible wars in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and the way that the Europeans overcame this was by tying themselves together in a rather bureaucratic, legalistic um, set of structures that effectively replaced the threat of force and competition using force by negotiated settlement and integration between them. So the Europeans are very heavily invested. Um, the cliche is sometimes used that this is the DNA of of Europe, of the European Union, is to invest in institutions, processes, and rules, um, which can sometimes make Europeans seem a, li <laughs> a little bit bureaucratic and a little bit stodgy, um, and you know perhaps a little bit unrealistic about what you can achieve through rules um, without the force to back it up. But that is a very kind of core part of how European countries are inclined to see the world. Um, and the second thing that's worth mentioning is that Europe, you know, despite this attempt to come together, actually is, um, has quite a lot of internal differences. We should remember when we think about Europe and the United States that Europe, you know, the United States is a single country. Um, Europe is a collection of, well, it was 28 countries. Now, after the Britain left, it's 27 countries. Uh, and these countries have a variety of different values, a variety of different concerns. The world looks very different if you're based in Poland or Lithuania looking across the border at Russia than it does if you're in Spain or Italy looking across the Mediterranean at uh, potential migration from uh, Libya. So that also makes Europe, you know, rather kind of slow actor because it has quite a big effort to try and bring all these different views together. Um, so it, uh, it moves slowly and it likes to operate through this rather legalistic set of processes. Um, having said that, the, you know, we shouldn't um, take this to mean that Europe has not noticed that the world is different now than they hoped after 1989. And um, one of the games among people who cover Europe or write about Europe is to see how often people are using the phrase wake up call. This is something that crops up a lot in coverage and discussions about Europe. Um, you know, such and such an event has been a wake-up call for Europe um, to bring it out of its kind of illusions and out of its um, feeling that, uh, you know, the, the world can be treated um, as if it was all like Europe. So, the, you know, in recent years, I think the, f the first and most significant one of these was when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. Um, and here, this was a neighboring country. Ukraine was... Um, in negotiations to deepen its ties with the EU. And um, in response to that process, Russia sent its troops you know, undercover into the eastern part of the country and annexed Crimea. So this was a reminder that sometimes um, you know, geopolitics happens, geopolitics hasn't gone away, um, and force can be used to quite strong effect. Um, and I think there are, Europeans have also drawn a rather similar lesson from what's happened in the Middle East and North Africa in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings of 2011, the Arab Spring, as the Arab Spring turned into the kind of Arab winter. Um, they've noticed that Russian intervention in Syria has actually enabled Syria to put down um, the uprising and to, to win. So there is recognition that military force counts. And um, there also is recognition in Europe that uh, China does not share the same values and that it does represent some kind of threat in various ways. So another landmark in Europe was a strategy paper, quite influential, that was published in 2019 about European relations with China. And the strategy paper described China as, at the same time, a partner, a rival, and uh, a, a systemic rival, sorry, a partner, a competitor, and a systemic rival. So you have to work together with China in some areas. In other areas, you're competing, say, in economic things. And in terms of political systems, they're rivals. They're, they have a system which is opposed to our system. So that was already quite a big step for Europe. Um, and in various ways, the Europeans have taken steps to try and limit China's influence in Europe 
they've put in investment screening to look at um, what China is trying to buy up so that China is not able to buy strategic assets, particularly in the technology field in Europe, um, and turn them to its own advantage. Um, and they've placed curbs you know, rather slowly, but they're beginning to do it now on the Chinese company Huawei being involved in 5G telecoms networks in Europe. So there is an awareness now in Europe that matches the awareness, I would say, that exists in the United States, that we're in a geopolitically competitive world and that we have to um, be aware of how to assert our values and our interests against rival powers. Um, but there are still limits to how far the US and Europe are together, are on the same page. And I'm going to highlight four reasons, I think, why um, there's still some tensions between Europe and the US. Uh, number one is what you could call the Trump effect. So President Trump's election was a shock. It was another wake-up call for Europe. Um, and it showed them that, you know, as Europeans saw it, um, here was the United States electing someone whose vision of the world was rather different from theirs. And this was a big shock. And it, I think it did lead many people in Europe to question, um, you know, how much they could depend on the transatlantic alliance to pursue their interests. Now, clearly Trump did recognize the threat of China in the same way as some people in, in Europe are coming to do, um, but the way that he approached international relations was rather diametrically opposed to what I presented as the kind of the way that Europeans like to see things. So President Trump was opposed to international alliances, which he tended to see as a, you know, a constraint on the freedom of action of the United States. He was opposed to international institutions which he felt diluted American influence. Um, and he was rather opposed to these kind of formalized processes. He had a more transactional vision of what would best serve the interests of the United States. Um, this isn't the place to argue whether this was a good or bad vision of how the United States should proceed, but it is worth emphasizing that this was you know, fundamentally anathema to how Europeans saw the world. And so his election caused a major crisis and you know, of course, Trump pulled out or pulled back from a series of um, processes and institutions that Europe was very committed to. The World Health Organization, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the nuclear deal with Iran. Um, and even there was some question about whether the mutual defense guarantee of NATO would be observed, although in the end he did um, affirm it. So that's the... Yeah, that, that was one thing. And then it's worth saying also after that, um, even after Trump was defeated, um, European perceptions of the United States, and this is now I'm talking about public perceptions, remained a little bit uncertain. And um, my organization did a series of opinion polls across Europe in November and December last year. So after the resu election results, but before President Biden took office, um, and what they found was really quite striking uh, in terms of uh, what Europeans thought about the United States and about American power. So I'm going to give you some polls. 51%, um, more than half of Europeans, thought that the United States political system was either completely broken or at least partially broken, somewhat broken. 59%, six out of 10 Europeans, said that they thought China would be more powerful than the United States within 10 years. And 60% say they would want their country to remain neutral in a confrontation between the United States and China. So there is among European publics quite a, a significant element of distrust about the United States. Um, I mean, to me, these, you know, the idea that China is going to be more powerful than the United States within 10 years seems to me quite mistaken. But these perceptions are strong in Europe. Um, third, I think there is a difference even beyond Trump about how um, the United States and Europe look at international order. And this is going back to what I said before, you know, we're in this situation where we have to cooperate with rival powers, um, but also compete. So how do you draw the balance between the need to work together? Because we can't, in the end, um, detach ourselves completely from China, from Russia, from the rest of the world. We're linked in together, but we can't agree on the values that we want. So we're in the situation of 
having to have a balance between, you know, working together and trying to defend ourselves against attempts from China and others, but China is seen as the forefront here to assert its interests and its values. Um, there, you know, we, there's this kind of twin track strategy. And I think both the United States and the EU understand the need to, do, to balance cooperation and competition. But I think the way that they would draw that balance is a little bit different. And this is a concern, I think, that exists in Europe, is the sense that the United States sees things in too confrontational a way. There's this sense that, um, that President Biden looks at the world as divided between democracies and authoritarian countries, um, as indeed he has said that he does. And he wants, you know, he's placed a lot of emphasis on the democratic world coming together to defend its values and its interests. <laughs> Um, and Europeans believe that that is an important thing. You know, they, they're horrified by what China is doing in uh, Xinjiang and in Hong Kong. Um, but at the same time, there's more of a sense in Europe that not everything that the world needs to, bat to, to work on divides neatly into democracies against authoritarian countries. Um, and they would say precisely that issues like COVID-19 um, and issues like climate change are ones where we have to find some way of working with um, other countries that don't share our political values. Now, I talked a little bit before about how um, you know, these kinds of international linkages had become competitive. We've seen that in COVID-19 with all the disputes about where the virus came from and all the attempts to use vaccines um, as diplomatic tools through vaccine diplomacy. So, and in climate change too, we see competition over the technology that's going to lead the climate transition. So there is a complicated balance, but Europeans worry that the United States is seeing things too much in terms of competition and not enough, leaving enough space for cooperation. Um, and that is why, as I said in that figure, Europeans think that the, you know, that the United States is leaning too much into having a cold war um, with China or with Russia. Um, now, I think the, the areas where you can actually divide this up and the areas where the US and Europe are able to work most effectively together um, are precisely those areas where values are inextricably linked with the kind of um, things that you're talking about. So technology, you know, I think it is quite difficult to see how we could um, compromise with China on the standards that are going to govern technology, that are going to govern AI. Um, because that is fundamentally a political issue and our vision of human rights and um, you know, limits on state control is sufficiently different from China's. But what, you know, when it comes to climate or when it comes to health, I think there's a difference. And Europeans are more invested in trying to make the international institutions work. They want to try and reform the World Health Organization to make sure that it is remaining at the center of the world's fight against the pandemic um, they want to reform the World Trade Organization to make it somehow able to handle trade between um, the West and China, despite the very different economic system that exists in China. Um, and what Europeans have noticed is that President Biden, although he says that he believes in international institutions and he's taken the United States back into the World Health Organization and he's tried to smooth over some of the differences on trade, um, they're skeptical that he goes quite as far as the Europeans. And they've noticed that he, President Biden has not removed the tariffs that um, President Trump put in place on China, tariffs which were imposed outside the World Trade Organization framework and which you know, seem to violate the World Trade Organization's rules. They've noticed that President Biden is opposed to a new global treaty on pandemics, which is something the Europeans would like to have because Europeans love institutions and processes. Um, but I think Biden is rather skeptical about the degree to which um, you could have a meaningful treaty that would bring in countries around the world that, you know, that have very different values. And would there be enough room for transparency um, and enforceability? And finally, it's also the case that um, European interests are very different. Uh, in certain ways, you know, Europe is much more um, vulnerable to 
migration from areas around the Middle East and North Africa. That, you know, the United States can pull out of Afghanistan and see it as just a, a security issue that was dealt with. But for Europe, a civil war in Afghanistan, if that happens, would lead to, to waves of migration. And European economies are much more integrated into glo global trade than the United States is. So the German economy is much more dependent on trade with China. Um, there's a figure here, um, $117 billion is how much German exports to China were worth in 2019. So again, you know, it's a somewhat different picture. So there are tensions, but I still think, and this is a dangerous moment, I think, because the Europeans looked at Trump and they said, this person does not share our values and we have to wait out his presidency. When Biden was elected, I think the Europeans thought, you know, now there's going to be a leader who believes in the same things that Europe do, does, and yet there are some tensions. Um, and these tensions came to a head with this, both with Afghanistan and uh, with the submarine deal. Um, but I think it would be really a mistake for the United States and Europe to drift apart. I think they share the same values. Um, and the European Union, however, you know, frustrating it can be at times to deal with, is still a very influential and forceful um, actor in the world. Um, and that's particularly true in economic terms. You know, the EU is the largest, single largest trading entity. And if we're in a world where international competition is taking place in economic terms as much as in military terms, then Europe and the United States really need to be on the same page. And if they are working together, um, then they can remain uh, powerful enough, I think, to have a significant impact. So that would be my plea that we look, try and look beyond the differences and the tensions. Um, and how can we do that? I'm going to give four headlines, but I'm at the end of my time, so I won't go into them more. Number one, recognize that the differences are not as great as they seem. Some of this is to do with um, rhetoric, to do with political positioning. Um, you know, it serves um, President Biden to accentuate the differences with China, and it serves the Europeans sometimes to downplay differences with China simply because they don't want to, um, you know, destroy a, a market that's very important, particularly to Germany. Uh, but views are changing in Europe. Um, Angela Merkel is stepping down as Chancellor of Germany. She's been the dominant figure in Europe for more than a decade, and she had a very um, commercial sense of the relationship with China. So her departure, I think, will change that. Um, and even people on the Biden team do emphasize that uh, the United States needs to work with China on issues like climate change and global health. So, you know, there's a difference of emphasis, but I think fundamentally it can be exaggerated. Um, number two, there can be a division of labor. Europe can do more in its neighborhood. Europe should develop more of an independent military force, and the United States should support that. Um, so there could be a degree of greater independence, but without forfeiting cooperation. Number three, communications. And this is one of the Europeans' concerns about Biden, is that he tends to see the United States as the leader of the world um, and makes decisions without a degree of consultation. And in order to maintain alliances, you do have to talk to each other. So um, on both sides, I think there's been, a, you know, a, cer a certain failure to recognize that. Um, step four, and this is where I'll end, I think we need a positive agenda. Um, in other words, rather than framing what the United States wants to do in the world as something against China, um, or framing what Europe is trying to do as, you know, working together to kind of try and bring China in, you know, both of which are perhaps uh, a rather simplistic way of looking at it. What about emphasizing the positive projects that Europe and the United States can do together in the world um, to try and deal with global challenges. So the biggest problem with COVID-19 to, to end where I began is not to do with you know, China's attempts to manipulate the narrative about how COVID started or use its vaccine exports to obtain political favors. You know, these things have happened, but the biggest problem is the vaccines are so unequally distributed around the world. Um, the biggest problem is that only one dose per every, for every 10 people 
has been distributed in Africa to this point. Um, and that in Southeast Asia also, it's, uh, you know, it's very bad. Um, the biggest problem in terms of climate is not to do with political maneuvering between um, the United States and China, but it's to do with you know, the failure to agree strong commitments and the failure to offer sufficient finance to countries around the world to help them with their climate transitions and to deal with the impacts of climate change. So I would end by saying the way forward for Europe and the United States is rather than framing what they're doing in terms of geopolitical competition, they have to recognize that competition but make a positive case that what, you know, that ultimately it's the value and the importance of what they believe in together that is what should define the future of the transatlantic relationship. So I'll end there. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I definitely would encourage you to come and ask things, either some, anything I've said or other concerns you have or other things that you'd be interested in knowing more about. So it's always a pleasure for me to interact with people. So do please come up. Hi. I'm Belle De La Rosa. I'm a political science major, and I just wanted to ask for your personal opinion. You mentioned how Europeans love institutions, but what's your take on the Brexit issue? Why did the UK leave the European Union? Thank you very much. So I, uh, I was anticipating <laughs> some interest in Brexit. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, Brexit is a big focus of attention in the UK. And surprisingly, I'm always surprised by how much people in the United States follow Brexit. Um, in continental Europe, it's not such an issue. They've kind of a little bit moved on, partly because they have so many other problems. But look, I think the main thing is, you know, Brexit is a loss for both sides. Um, the UK loses economically through its being cut off from its largest trading partners. Uh, but the European Union also loses because Britain, I think, brought quite a lot. It brought a more geopolitical sense to the European Union. It was a bit less invested in this kind of vision that I've talked about um, of institution building. And it, you know, Britain has a fantastic diplomatic service and a very strong military. So I think it had quite a savvy vision of the world. And of course, Britain you know, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. So in all that res those respects, I think the EU loses something from Brexit. Um, what it also reinforced, I think, in Europe is a kind of fear of populism. It, you know, they were worried. That's one reason why the split has been quite acrimonious, because Europeans worried that um, other countries might follow the UK, you know, that this was a, a blow to the ideas that Europe held so so dear that, uh, you know, that we all need to be together in, in an institution. Um, and it's been discouraging to see how bad relations have been between the EU and the UK since Britain left. Um, partly, I think that's to do with the personality of the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who is, uh, you know, rather more cavalier figure than um, the Europeans. And, you know, he does seem to have this view that you could sign a, a treaty about the terms of Britain's withdrawal and then reinterpret the treaty afterwards, you know, within a year, which you're exactly the kind of thing that completely freaks Europeans out. Uh, so, but is, you know, it's rather kind of characteristic of his freewheeling style. Um, ultimately, the UK and the EU have so much in common and so many common interests, and particularly in these things that I've been talking about. Um, you know, for instance, in Afghanistan. Um, in fact, Afghanistan was the, one of the first times that I've really heard quite a lot of people from the Conservative Party in the UK really lamenting the departure or, or talking about the need to work with, with European countries. You know, because from the United States, pulling out of Afghanistan, you can argue with how it was done, but it makes sense. There's, I don't think there's a strong reason that the U.S. needs to still be in Afghanistan. Um, but for European countries, Afghanistan is a lot closer. It's, um, it's a potential source of refugees. And also, European countries continue to have a much more serious problem with terrorism and with uh, jihadi radicalism than the United States. You know, the U.S. has been very successful in keeping that out since 9-11. 
whereas European countries are still troubled by it. So, you know, there's a stronger case for both the UK and the EU having some sort of military engagement, but they couldn't do it without the United States. And the reason they couldn't is that they haven't developed enough of either military capacity or a kind of strategic way of thinking. So, you know, we could see possibly in the future both the UK and European countries wanting to develop some way of working together, some sense that they share interests in the neighborhood that the United States doesn't share to do with instability in the Middle East or in North Africa or in the regions, you know, the former Soviet space, Ukraine or somewhere like that. Um, but we're a long way from that because the process has been so acrimonious and it's a real shame. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Hi, my name is Savannah Levitt. I'm also a political science major. And I'm wondering about, you were talking about the uh, positive agenda between the United States and the EU. And I'm wondering, it sounds like you're talking about that more in the sense of focusing on uh, concepts that we agree on or like concepts that are less controversial. How would you balance that with concepts that are a little more controversial? I think there's, you know, there are always going to be controversies and there are going to be differences. But I think they're less significant than um, in substance than they are perhaps in rhetoric. This is the point that I'm trying to make. So if you really look at what the United States is doing in terms of China, you know, as President Biden said when he addressed the United Nations yesterday, the United States is not seeking a Cold War with China. And John Kerry, the, the American climate envoy, you know, he is trying to work very closely with China on climate because he has to, because nothing is going to happen. You know, China is the world's largest emitter of carbon. Um, so there is quite a lot going on. I don't think the underlying vision is that different. Um, but I think what really disturbs the Europeans is the, you know, to have measures that, um, that both countries, both partners might want to take to have them framed in anti-Chinese terms. That's what, you know, they don't want sort of, Amer you know, joint projects on technology or building infrastructure um, in Africa or building infrastructure in South Asia um, or security exercises. They don't want these framed as measures against China because they are concerned that, you know, that there could be a sort of escalation of rhetoric. Uh, and that we could find ourselves trapped in a cycle of um, each side provoking each other and would lose the capacity to work together. So that's why I think this notion of a positive agenda is promising, um, is because you concentrate on the substance that's shared. Now, of course, there are still going to be disagreements. There's going to be disagreements on trade. There's going to be um, disagreements on some sort of security steps. Um, and then, you know, that's not surprising. And I think a kind of, it would actually, here I'm going to say something that's kind of anti or critical of the Europeans. You know, the Europeans have been free riding on the American security guarantee for a long time. And um, they've been able to concentrate on their kind of idealistic vision where force, you know, is kind of reduced and marginalized as an element of international politics. But they've done this secure in the knowledge that the U.S. will ultimately protect them. And... What happened in Afghanistan? The Europeans were very upset by the way that all played out. Uh, but actually, the Europeans had never worked out exactly what was their goal in Afghanistan, what was their strategy, what were they trying to do in the country. They never defined an independent mission for Europe. Um, they were just tagging along behind the Americans. And then when the Americans pulled, you know, pulled out, Europe was left high and dry. So I think the Europeans need to define a bit more what they want. Um, and adopt a slightly more grown-up approach themselves. And I think if, the, you know, if there was more self-confidence in Europe and a clearer sense that we have different interests and some different responsibilities, but also a lot of things in common, then the relationship would be better. And I think you know, there's, it's partly the fact that, um, you know, is that the, the way that the Europeans have tended to look at the United States hasn't helped. So, uh, you know, more more kind of maturity and more independence, I think, would, would improve the relationship, actually. A acknowledge the points of difference and then let them stand in the way. Thank you. 
Hey, uh, I'm Will Ford. I'm a polit or, uh, I'm a international relations major and a freshman. Uh, so I have one question. So you've obviously talked a lot about how the U.S. and Europe have a lot of different shared values of democracy and how we need to work better on promoting those, particularly on issues where that works out. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen in recent years is in some uh, European countries like Hungary and Poland, particularly with Viktor Orban, there's authoritarian backsliding within their own ranks. So how do they balance that with promoting liberalism abroad? Yeah, that's a very good point. And actually, I, I'd meant to say something when I was talking about the differences within Europe on that point, but then I was sort of felt like I was running late, so I didn't get into it. But it's a, it is definitely a, a concern and an issue. And, you know, there are, there is a strong sense in Europe that their vision of liberal order is not only threatened from outside, but it's threatened from within. And um, as you said, you know, Poland and Hungary have these um, governments that have taken steps that are quite concerning in terms of the rule of law. And the European Union is very belatedly trying to um, kind of come up with a tough response to that by defining the uh, conditionality in terms of some of the funding that they're distributing as being linked to the rule of law. And we'll see how there's a tendency to try and brush over those splits and you know, those divergences within Europe and hope that they would go away. Um, and I think this is part of perhaps the same European tendency to you know, to hope that things can be resolved rather than having to face up to the difficult choices that need to be made. So I hope that they're doing that now. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that Europeans are trying to do with their attempt to come up with a, a new v approach to, to international order is precisely to, to find a kind of internationalism that will um, limit the appeal of populism at home. So... You know, this is something I think that uh, President Macron in France is particularly concerned about. Um, they want, uh, you know, a kind of international cooperation that delivers results for European citizens. And this is why he's putting a lot of emphasis on issues like public health um, and, you know, also counterterrorism. It's why migration remains a, you know, very problematic issue where Europeans, despite their you know, belief in liberal values, Europeans have adopted quite a tough line on migration and they, you know, see the goal of migration as keeping the numbers down. And this, you know, I think this does reckon, go to the fact that they see, um, you know, a threat from populism in others as well. And so they're sort of struggling both to find a, a system of multilateralism and the international order that can deal with the external threats, but still find a way of working together. And they're trying to find a vision that's sustainable in terms of domestic support at home. So they recognize, and this is a bit like President Biden's foreign policy for the middle class. You know, I think Europeans are looking for what, the, the, what Macron calls a, um, a foreign policy that protects, a Europe that protects. You know, they want to try and make that link, which I think a lot of political leaders are trying to do now, a link between foreign policy and the concerns of people at home, because there's a danger that if foreign policy is just seen as something for the global elites, um, then you will lose your own populations. So it's, uh, you know, and, and that I think is, a, again, a, a, something where the United States and Europe are, are together. You know, it's a, a world where you have to deal with new threats outside and also new kinds of concerns domestically. I enjoyed your lecture. I'm Eric Heyer. I, I'm uh, the coordinator for Asian Studies here in the Kennedy Center. I, I'd like to go back to the beginning of your lecture because it's so timely uh, and talk about the the, the French-American Anglo uh, problem. Yeah. This will include the Aussies too. I must say, when I first when I heard this announced, I just thought that the, my first uh, response was Biden just seemed tone deaf. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can help us, from, given your American and European perspective, why the French were excluded from such a re an agreement and why they were not included. Were the British opposed to this? Were the Australians opposed to this? Were the Americans opposed to this? It seems just logical to include the French if we, it, because they are an Indo-Pacific power and it made yeah. sense and we could have avoided the problems we have now. Yeah, I agree. I think it was very, I'm surprised and, you know, I haven't 
kind of looked into it yet as deeply as I'd like to. Um, I think one thing that's going on here is, you know, perhaps it's true that there is a degree of kind of, um, you know, tone deafness or inflexibility in the foreign policy that this administration has conducted so far. Um, and that certainly is the perception in, in Europe. You know, they feel that they're not being consulted. Um, they feel that decisions are sort of made and then announced. Um, you know, that there's not a kind of flexible engagement. Um, that is a European concern. I think another thing that's going on here is that, you know, there is um, this kind of strong tradition of Anglophone cooperation on security and intelligence matters particularly. Um, and I guess maybe this is a residue of that. Um, you know, the five eyes, intelligence network, and so on. And obviously, Canada and New Zealand are in that, but the kind of dominant members in terms of the sort of security side are the, these three, United States, UK, and, and Australia. Um, and I think, you know, that to me is perhaps why the UK is in there, because otherwise what else, you know, what, what really is the UK contributing? Um, it's, you know, it's, I suppose it's to diversify it a bit and connect it with this kind of form of cooperation. So it's almost like, I think, but I think there was a degree of oversight about how this would be perceived. And, you know, as you say, France is definitely going to remain a significant Indo-Pacific um, force. It's very interested in the region. It's been trying to lead European efforts to, you know, focus more attention on the region. Um, and I think the way it's handled has really been, I mean, obviously there is this commercial aspect, um, which is unfortunate, and the communications around it were very unfortunate. But yeah, to, for, to succeed in this strategy of, you know, having a kind of containment of China or a you know, strong stand against China, it's crazy to divide France from this effort. So it was definitely, uh, you know, poorly handled. And, uh, um, in that sense, mistake. I don't know whether France could have had a formal role in the agreement, you know, and then perhaps some, there's some element of um, concern that, you know, France is perhaps not as invested in, in doing something that's going to be as tough on China. But I don't know whether that's really part of it or not. You know, is there a sort of concern about, you know, a different vision, or is it just a... Uh, um, you know, a kind of badly handled initiative. It'd be interesting to know. Yeah.